One minute ago, Hawaii's volcano launched a wall of lava 1,500 feet high into the night, shattering every expectation of how eruptions unfold. Scientists froze as routine monitoring spun out of control, revealing a surge faster and hotter than nearly anything since Kilauea Iki in 1959. Why did this eruption rewrite the playbook? And what does it expose about the hidden power moving beneath Hawaii right now? To understand the anomaly, you first have to know what normal truly looks like. On most days, Kilauea's summit is a study in quiet persistence. The surface shifts, but the changes are measured. Lava seeps out in steady streams, creating glossy pahoeho channels that wind across the crater floor. These flows advance at a walking pace, their surfaces folding and wrinkling into intricate patterns as the molten rock cools. When fountains do appear, they rarely reach beyond 100 to 300 feet, sending arcs of orange high enough to impress, but well within the boundaries that scientists expect. The rhythm is familiar, subtle ground swelling, a cluster of small earthquakes, and then a gentle outpouring of lava. Halamau Mau Crater, the heart of Kilauea, has seen this cycle repeat countless times in recent years. The landscape builds up slowly, layer by layer, as new lava sheets settle over old. Researchers track these episodes with a routine confidence. Tilt meters record the volcano's breathing, gas sensors log steady pulses of sulfur dioxide, and field teams collect samples from still glowing crusts. The entire process unfolds over days or weeks, giving ample time for alerts, field work, and public warnings. Even the most energetic fountains in recent memory have stayed well below the legendary heights of past decades. For the scientists and residents who live with Kilauea, this is what normal looks like. A volcano that moves fast enough to shape the land, but slow enough to watch, measure, and understand. For scientists at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, the 2025 eruption drew instant comparisons to two legendary benchmarks. In 1959, Kilauea Iki stunned both researchers and the public with a lava fountain that soared to nearly 1,900 feet, taller than any fountain reliably measured in Hawaii before or since. That episode unfolded in a series of spectacular bursts, each one pushing the limits of what was thought possible for a basaltic shield volcano. The visual record from that night, jets of molten rock reaching five times the height of a city skyscraper, became the gold standard for volcanic intensity on the islands. Fast forward to 2018, the Lower East Rift Zone eruption rewrote the playbook for speed. Instead of a gradual buildup, magma raced through the rift, breaching the surface in new neighborhoods with almost no warning. The effusion rate during those first hours was so high that entire subdivisions were threatened before dawn. Scientists measured lava output at over 200 cubic meters per second, double or triple the rate seen in most summit eruptions. The sheer pace of dike propagation and the rapid transition from intrusion to full eruption forced a re-evaluation of hazard models in real time. These two events, Kilauea Iki's vertical spectacle and the Lower East Rift Zone's horizontal onslaught, set the outer boundaries of what Hawaiian volcanism can do. Against this backdrop, the 2025 fountains, reaching 1,500 feet in less than two hours, stood out, not just for their height, but for the speed at which they developed. For the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory team, the familiar rhythm of slow, predictable change gave way to, to a scenario that demanded new thinking about how fast magma can move, how high it can jet, and how quickly a routine night can become historic. At 7.30 p.m. on October 17, 2025, a sudden spike jolted the summit tilt meter at Uekahuna. The needle lurched past routine microradian swings and triggered an automated alarm in the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory control room. At the same instant, a cluster of seismic stations flagged a sharp jump in volcanic tremor, signals that had, until now, always built over hours or days. The duty geophysicist monitoring the live feeds watched as the tilt trace dropped nearly two microradians in minutes. That rate of ground movement had only appeared in the archives during the most explosive summit events. The alarm system, calibrated to filter out false positives, lit up three separate consoles. 
With every second, the red line readings grew more urgent. Not just a single instrument, but a chorus, tilt, seismic, and gas sensors all spiking together. Protocol required immediate verification. The geophysicists scanned cross plots for noise or instrument drift, but the pattern held. Slack messages pinged between stations. Anyone else seeing this? And confirmation came back from field teams and remote logins. The numbers pointed to one clear conclusion. A major dike was on the move, and the summit was deflating at a pace not seen since the legendary Kilauea Aki episode. The system's alert threshold had been breached by a wide margin. Within minutes, the decision was made to escalate. Emergency radio codes were sent to on-call scientists and park officials. The first public notice would go out before any visual confirmation, a rare step reserved for only the most urgent cases. The instruments had spoken. The volcano was moving faster than anyone had planned for. Inside the control room, the duty geophysicists' call set off a chain reaction. Phones rang out to every on-call scientist, field technician, and park liaison. The standard protocol, meant for hours of lead time, collapsed into a matter of minutes. Within five minutes of the first confirmed tilt drop, the first field team was already suiting up at the Hawaii Volcano Observatory garage, grabbing gas masks, headlamps, and a portable spectrometer. Dispatch logs would later show a flurry of radio check-ins. Alpha 1, rolling, Bravo, en route to Uekahuna. Vehicles peeled out toward the crater rim, headlights slashing through the darkness. Teams raced to their assigned posts. Inside the observatory, staff worked through a rapid checklist. The duty geophysicist authorized a drone launch before the first fountain was even visible. Mobile gas sensors were loaded for deployment at the summit transect. A second team prepped the mobile lab for field chemistry. No time for the usual calibration routines. Every minute mattered. Slack channels and radio nets buzzed with clipped updates, confirmation codes, instrument status, new readings. One volcanologist, still in office attire, was handed a hard hat and a set of fresh batteries at the door. By 8.10 p.m., less than 10 minutes after the initial alarm, the first vehicle reached the windward crater overlook. The team's orders were simple. Collect the first batch of lava spatter, sample the plume, and relay fountain height estimates back to two, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory. Park rangers, already alerted by the initial radio burst, began closing access roads while civil defense activated the emergency notification system. The pace was relentless. Every action compressed, every decision weighed against the reality that the volcano was moving faster than any field protocol had ever anticipated. Sulfur hangs thick in the air as the field team steps out onto the windward edge of Halema Uma'u. The lead technician, boots crunching over fresh cinders, pulls a thermal camera from its case and begins a sweep across the crater floor. Lava fountains roar in the background, so loud that radio chatter has to be shouted. Every minute, the spatter ramparts along the vent edge grow higher, molten blobs landing with a hiss and instantly welding into walls that block the team's view of the far side. The technician signals for a quick grab. A metal scoop darts out on a pole, snatching a clump of incandescent spatter before it cools. Another team member, face shielded against glass fibers, drops the sample into a steel can for later viscosity and temperature checks. The heat is intense. Infrared readings show flow surfaces at over 1,100 degrees Celsius, with the hottest jets pushing even higher. Thermal images stitched together in real time on a ruggedized tablet. The technician's gloved finger traces the leading edge of a new lava channel already racing across the crater floor. Pixel tracking software clocks the advance at nearly 20 meters per second, far faster than any summit flow in recent memory. Over the radio, another field team calls out rampart heights, up by half a meter in just 15 minutes. The technician wipes a layer of Pele's hair from the tablet screen, eyes flicking between the flow field and the growing stack of real-time thermal mosaics. Every scan, every sample, every measurement is relayed back to the observatory for immediate cross-check. In these first chaotic hours, the only certainty is movement, the land itself changing faster than anyone thought possible. A gas specialist leans over the FTIR spectrometer, eyes locked on the digital readout as the first plume sweeps overhead. The numbers climb fast, 
Sulfur dioxide flux breaks 30,000 tons per day, a surge not seen in years. Field radios crackle with updates. The carbon dioxide to sulfur dioxide ratio is spiking above 1.0, well beyond baseline summit values. This is not shallow, recycled magma. The ratio hints at a deep, volatile-rich source. Magma that has raced from the mantle with barely a pause in the crust. A fresh spatter sample, still steaming, lands in the mobile lab's steel tray. Quick glass analysis shows less than 2% microlite crystals in the first hour. Almost pure volcanic glass, nearly identical to the primitive basalt of Kilauea Iki's record fountains. The melt's magnesium content is striking. 8.4% magnesium oxide, with a chemistry signature that matches near-primary mantle melt. The sample team runs viscosity checks and confirms what the field crews have already seen. This lava is ultra-hot, low in crystals, and able to jet skyward at impossible speeds. Every instrument in the mobile lab tells the same story. The gas transect data, relayed from a drone intercepting the plume, confirms the early carbon dioxide to sulfur dioxide anomaly, while airborne FTIR readings from a second team show the ratio dropping as the episode continues. As the fountains wane, crystallinity climbs, and gas ratios settle toward background. The pattern is clear. A deep gas charge pulse drove the opening act, leaving a paradigm-busting trail of evidence across every data set. In the control room, the specialist's hands hover over the keyboard, already drafting a memo. This eruption just rewrote the rules on how fast and how deep Hawaiian magma can move. A petrologist from the HVO laboratory stands by the sample tray, double-checking field numbers as the latest glass clasts cool in their steel cans. But the real test for the deep magma surge comes from outside the lab, across a network of sensors and satellites that rarely agree so quickly. Within hours of the first fountain, INSAR analysts begin processing fresh satellite passes. The resulting deformation maps reveal a sharp linear grubbin, new ground cracks slicing across the summit, perfectly aligned with the eruption's twin vents. The geometry is unmistakable. A dike has forced its way up, warping the crater floor in a matter of minutes. The displacement footprint, measured in tens of centimeters, matches the scale of summit deflation logged by tilt meters and GPS. Meanwhile, infrasound arrays stationed miles from the caldera record a continuous saturating jet. The acoustic signature, rich in low-frequency energy, tracks each pulse of the fountain, with amplitude peaks aligning to the precise moments when photogrammetry clocks the jets at their highest. There is no ambiguity in the timing. The ground moves, the air shakes, and the lava leaps skyward in perfect sync. Remote drone photogrammetry confirms the curtain of fire, with frame-by-frame -frame analysis putting the south vent at 1,500 feet, just after 10.15 p.m. The final data packet from a doomed UAS, lost to the plume, transmits a last set of spatial coordinates and thermal images that lock in the fountain's true height. Across the labs, the evidence converges. Deformation, seismicity, gas, and chemistry all point to a deep, gas-rich pulse that bypassed the usual crustal reservoirs. The petrologist reviews the cross-lab reports. Primitive basalt, low microlite content, saturated jet infrasound, and a fresh grubbin mapped by satellite. For the scientific team, the consensus is clear. This was not a routine eruption. The speed, scale, and depth of the 2025 event are now locked in by independent lines of proof, each data set reinforcing the next. What began as a series of alarms has become a textbook example of rapid, deep-sourced volsonic change, captured and confirmed in real time. Lava broke free from both summit vents, racing across the crater floor with a speed that stunned even the most seasoned field teams. The initial flows, glossy and incandescent, poured out as fast-moving rivers of Pahoaho. Within minutes, these channels carved new paths, stacking molten sheets over still-steaming ground. Field instruments clocked the leading edge at nearly 20 meters per second a pace that rivaled the legendary 1959 Kilauea Iki episode and far outstripped anything seen in recent years. The crater boundaries, steep and confining, held the eruption's full force inside Halema'uma'u, but the scale of movement left little room for error. Every second the flow front advanced, swallowing old ramparts and building new ones in its wake. 
Close to the vents, the heat was overwhelming. Scientists in protective gear skirted the margins, their boots sinking into still soft crust as they tried to keep up with the advancing lava. In the first hour, the flows stayed smooth and ropey. Classic pahoeho, thanks to the high temperature and low crystal content of the fresh magma. But as the night wore on, cooling and subtle shifts in terrain began to roughen the surface. Where the channels hit slight rises or steeper slopes, the flows thickened and slowed, threatening to break up into blocky ah ah if the eruption continued or escaped the crater bowl. For this episode, the topography kept most of the action contained, sparing roads, utilities, and park infrastructure from direct overrun. Still, the danger was real. Emergency teams closed trails and posted air quality warnings as airborne glass fibers, Pele's hair, drifted downwind, coating surfaces miles from the source. By early morning, the lava had covered nearly two-thirds of the crater floor. No ocean entry occurred and no lays plumes formed, but the sheer speed and volume of the flows forced a rethinking of response plans. The lesson was clear. When Kilauea surges, even familiar ground can become a hazard zone in minutes. Fallout. Downwind from the vent, fallout began almost as soon as the fountains reached full height. Fine threads of volcanic glass, Pele's hair, drifted on the wind, settling across roads, rooftops, and open fields as far as 15 kilometers from the summit. By midnight, County air quality monitors were logging the highest particulate readings since the 2018 eruption. Residents in the Kau and Puna districts woke to a gritty film on their cars and porches, while public health alerts warned of eye and skin irritation, especially for children and those with respiratory issues. Roofs. For homes and businesses in the fallout zone, the threat was not just the air. Roofs, especially those with shallow pitches or aging materials, faced a new kind of loading hazard. Structural engineers estimate that just a few centimeters of wet tephra, ash mixed with rain or dew, can add hundreds of kilograms across a typical residential rooftop. In the hardest hit areas, civil defense teams made rounds through the night, checking on vulnerable structures and reminding residents to clear gutters and sweep off accumulated ash before it could soak in and double its weight. Farmland? Farms on the volcano's flanks faced their own crisis. Glass fibers and fine ash coated crops and pasture land, raising concerns about contamination of water supplies and livestock feed. Emergency advisories went out to farm operators, urging them to cover catchment tanks and keep animals indoors until the air cleared. Meanwhile, rolling road closures cut off access to several key corridors, including the main park loop and segments of Highway 11, as county crews worked to clear debris and monitor for new hazards. For residents and workers, the speed of these closures and the uncertainty about when routes would reopen added a layer of anxiety to an already tense night. The eruption's reach extended far beyond the crater, touching lives and livelihoods in ways that would take days or even weeks to fully measure. Every time Hawaii's volcanic plumbing rewrites itself at breakneck speed, the margin for human response shrinks. Today, over 200,000 residents live on active flanks, where minutes, not hours, can separate routine from disaster. As magma finds new shortcuts, so must our readiness. Nature does not negotiate. It only reminds us how quickly the ground beneath us can change, 